Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, I did have a funny video I wanted to show you to start off my sermon, but wouldn't you know the first time I want to show a video, our projector bulb is out. So, I'm sure you're excited about this. I get to act it out for you. All right, here we go. Today our scripture meditation is on our gospel reading, Luke chapter 13. <sighs> Do you mind if I digress a bit from my planned message today? Ugh, you guys, just sometimes you're bad. You're making me look bad in front of God. I took a vow not to say who's the worst, but Dan is the worst. Don't be like Dan. He's the worst. Just do better. Look, Jesus has something to say. He says, stop it. This is the word of the Lord. Now that video... You can find it on YouTube. We're going to link it on our Facebook page tomorrow. It's called Honest Preacher. And it's obviously a joke, but it does give voice to something that we sometimes think about others and wish we could say. Particularly the part where he says, I took a vow not to say who's the worst, but Dan, Dan is the worst. And if there are any other Dans out there, that is just a pure coincidence. <laughs> no Dans were harmed in the making of this video. All right, but we've had such thoughts about others as well, if we're being honest, right? Well, at least I'm not that person, and if something happened to them, then they'd say, well, I'm not perfect, but, but this person, and we do that to feel better about ourselves, or if something bad happens to those people, we might think, you know what, they deserve it. They're just getting what they deserve because they're a terrible person. Does God agree with these kinds of statements? How does he feel about these supposedly really sinful people? Is their punishment his doing because they are, as in the video, the worst? Well, in our gospel reading today, Jesus addresses this idea pretty directly. Yet his answer has a different focus than you might think. It has a different focus than we certainly naturally think. See, rather than focus on God's judgment, Jesus focuses and brings to the forefront the mercy of God. So in our gospel reading, what is the situation? Jesus has just talked about being able to understand what the critical time is. And after he's been talking about that, a group of Galileans come up and they're gossiping and they want to talk to Jesus about this particular group of people who, when they went to offer their sacrifices in the temple, the Roman prefect or the governor Pontius Pilate killed them in the temple, thus mixing their own blood with the blood of the sacrifices they were offering at the temple. Now, we don't have direct correlation outside of the scriptures for this event, but we do have enough information historically about Pontius Pilate to know this is certainly not outside the realm of the way he dealt with the Jews. He was known for being cruel, oppressive, and he repeatedly offended the religious sensibilities of the Jews. For example, he put up a picture of the Roman emperor in the temple. So we certainly can believe what these people are talking about. But in speaking about this event, Jesus' response to what they're saying indicates that what they were making the case for was that these people must have done something extra special, extra horrible, to deserve what happened to them. And they want to get Jesus' opinion about that. They think that these people were more sinful than others. And usually when we're talking about the others, we mean they're more sinful than us. 
I'm not in that group. Well, here's Jesus' response to that in verse 2. He says, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Jesus doesn't mince any words. He cuts right to the chase. Is that what you're thinking? And if we're reading that, pretty honestly, we've found ourselves having that thought at times, too. And Jesus' question strikes pretty hard. Do you think that those people are worse sinners than you because they've suffered in this way? This isn't the only time Jesus confronts this thinking. In John chapter 9, he confronts it with his own disciples when they come up on a man who's been blind from birth and the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And again, Jesus' response is the same. What does that have anything to do with it? But don't we do that too? Often to make ourselves feel better. Did you hear what Joey did? He totally deserved what happened to him too. Serves them right for what they were saying and doing. I'm so happy they got what was coming to them. After all, they deserved it. I'm so thankful that isn't me. Dan is the worst. Do you feel better? Yeah, in a sense, right? Because at least I'm not one of those people. At least that's what we tell ourselves. But Jesus says here, not so fast. Not so fast. Right after he asks that question, he answers it as well. No, I tell you. Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Whoa. Doesn't get any clearer than that. And the sinful part of us wants to say, Hey, Jesus. Don't lump me in with those people. They're the worst. I'm pretty decent. After all, this wasn't some random event that just happened in the world. There were human actors. Pontius Pilate came in and did this to them because they did something bad. They were punished because they were wicked. But as almost as if Jesus anticipates exactly that line of rationale, He gives us another example that blows it apart. He says, Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? And again, the old Adam in us pops up and says, But that isn't the same. This was some random happening, some just disastrous tragedy. How can you put those two things together? Well, from the mindset of the Galileans at the beginning, we wouldn't. But yet, Jesus, the Lord of all creation, does. Why does he do so? Well, Jesus emphasizes the sameness of these two events by having the exact same response to each. Again, he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Both these Galileans killed by Pilate and those poor people who just happened to be by a building and it fell on top of them. The same thing. Of course, Jesus is emphasizing here it wasn't because of one particular exceptionally horrible sin that these people suffered in this way, but rather it's an example of the sinful fallen state of the world. And then You no longer have the ability to say them and me because we're all in that same sinful and fallen state. And if that's true, and if they're not the worst, what happens now? What should I think of those sorts of events? If it isn't that person is extra bad and they are getting what they deserve and I'm not like that, I'm pretty good. 
Then Jesus continues with the call to repent. He says, no, they're not extra bad. And I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We're supposed to repent. But wait a minute, Jesus. We were talking about them. Why are you talking about me? Let's keep looking at them. I don't want to look at me. Isn't that the whole point after all? That's why we're focusing on this, so that we don't have to focus on me. Because I don't want to see what shows up in the mirror, particularly the mirror of the law. <coughs> well, Jesus is teaching us here that our response to such events shouldn't be the judgment of those involved. That's God's domain, not ours. Rather, it should be because they're no more sinful than you. A call to mind our own sinfulness and repent, to turn away, to go back to Christ. And to emphasize this truth, Jesus teaches a parable. And this parable, again, emphasizes a call to repentance, and it highlights God's mercy in response to these situations rather than his judgment. Now, it doesn't remove God's judgment, but that's not the focus of the parable. So the parable is the vineyard and the fig tree and the vine dresser. And the vineyard and the fig tree are common Old Testament metaphors for the people of Israel, the people of God. And here, the emphasis is on God's mercy because when the master of the vineyard returns, after three years, every year, this fig tree has not borne any fruit. It's just taken up space in his garden, it's using up the nutrients of the ground and yields nothing. And so he says, cut it down. I've had it with this tree. That seems to echo the, the earthly sentiments we might have about someone we perceive to be worse than us. They got what they deserved. But the vine dresser speaks up on behalf of this unfruitful tree. Now it says specifically three years that this tree has not borne fruit, so some commentators believe that is in reference to the earthly ministry of Jesus, that he's been calling for a turn away from wickedness and evil from the people of God in, in, in the surrounding area of Jerusalem, and he's been doing it for three years, and as of yet there is no fruit born in repentance among the religious leaders. And so the master of the vineyard says, cut it out. But then the vine dresser speaks up. And in this case, the vine dresser is Jesus. And he says, hold off one more year. Let me work the ground and put manure on it. Let me fertilize it and take care of it. And then come back next year. And if it bears fruit, great. If not, then cut it down. So this parable has a very specific meaning and a broader application. The broader application is the vine dresser is Jesus, but it's also all of those who walk around with the gospel of peace, who intercede on behalf of those who are struggling in sin in this fallen creation. Recognizing that we're all sinful and fall short of the glory of God, they are a people who go about with the compassion of Christ rather than the judgment of God. Notice again, the judgment is not removed, but it is placed in its proper context, in the hands of God. But it does help us understand the urgency that Paul speaks with in the New Testament. Christ is coming back. We don't know when, but it's going to be soon. We should bear fruit. How do we bear fruit then? I thought you weren't supposed to do things in order to be saved, so what's this bearing fruit stuff? Well, our takeaway is that no one is more sinful than others in the religious sense. Right? In the eyes of God, we all stand justly accused of sin. We all fall short. 
and the individual tragedies and wicked events of this world are not a referendum on particular sins, but rather a evidence of this state in which we all need repentance. So we need to repent. In the words of Luther, we recognize that we daily sin much and need a Savior. Otherwise, as Jesus says here, we will all likewise perish. So how does one bear fruit in keeping with repentance? Receive the Holy Spirit given freely in Jesus. Hear his word. Receive the sacraments regularly. Be among the body of Christ where God brings the gifts of his spirit to his people. This is one of my favorite aspects of our confession of faith as Lutherans, that we believe in a means of grace theology, that our God in his mercy and in his desire to call us back to himself and his desire that we repent and turn away. Remember our Old Testament reading says that God does not delight in the death of the wicked, but that they turn from their ways and live. He's talking about you and me. He wants us to come back to him. He wants us to repent. And so, in his mercy, through the church, through his disciples, on down to today, he comes to us through those means to do precisely that. If you're gathered here this morning to receive those means for that precise purpose. Maybe today when you got here, you thought you were here for some other reason. Maybe you thought you were here to sing or to see a friend or just because it's what you do on Sunday mornings. But really what you're here to do is to receive the means of God's grace in Jesus. And through that reception and through that mercy, we are called to repent repentance, prompted by the Holy Spirit to turn away from our wicked ways and live. After all, God loves us. That's what he wants us to do. So even that, mercifully, is not on us. As the church, you and I were called to bring the Holy Spirit to bear in the world through those same means. Share the word of God with those in your life who need to do this, who need to repent and turn away from their wickedness. Not so you can be right and they can be wrong, but so that they can know Jesus and live. So that they too can experience the same mercy that lifted you off the path of wickedness to Christ. So dear friends in Christ, here our Lord calls us to look at those sorts of events and rather than speak God's judgment, point to his mercy, point to his forbearance. And with a sense of urgency because this time does come to an end. This time for repentance, this time for forgiveness is not forever. God's judgment will come. So knowing that, we go out into the world as workers of mercy, as witnesses to Christ, to join in Jesus' call to repentance by sharing the glorious message of the gospel to all those that we meet. In the name of Jesus, amen.